but this is a question from a young person because he says he's a young person. Um, and I think it's important. It re relates to the question you just asked. So it said, would you please talk about the bonds between conservative America and Israel? I think perhaps my age limits my understanding. What combination of ideology, propaganda, lobbying, and money makes Israel's security such a sacred American cow? A wonderful question, I think. Well, it's a good question, but we, and, and, and these are important factors. I mean, let's start with what's called conservative support from Israel. At first, I think some kind of somatic hygiene is useful. Uh, there's really no conservatives in the United States. The people who are called conservatives are radical statists for the most part. Uh, that's very different from... Uh, uh, and there are a few genuine conservatives, which means something like classical liberals, but not many. Uh, the, what are called the cons if you take a look at what's at the Republican Party today, which is the strongest, you know, extreme support for Israeli policies, they have a popular base. Uh, a large part of the popular base is Christian evangelicals. They are passionate supporters of Isra Israeli policies, and they are also extreme anti-Semites. If you take a look at their, <laughs> you take a look at the, they don't say it. But take a look at the doctrines, like the dispensationalist doctrines. Yeah, yeah. They're looking forward to a battle in Armageddon, you know, where everybody gets murdered and the saved souls rise to heaven. Now, what happens to the Jews? Well, you know, according to some of these versions, 160,000 of them find Christ in time and they're saved. The rest are condemned to eternal damnation. How can you be more anti-Semitic than that? You know, and in fact, they're, you know, they're, uh, but their support for Israel is because partly, you know, interpretation of the Bible, interpretation of the Book of Revelations, and so on and so forth, which leads them to strongly support Israeli crimes, but to the extent that, I mean, Israel welcomes the support, but it also tries to control them like when they try to blow up the Temple Mount and so on. Israel doesn't think that's a good idea, so they block them. But why is the Republican Party, why does it have a popular base like that? That's part of its popular base. Another part of its popular base is people who are so terrified that they have to have a gun in their pocket when they go into Starbucks to get a cup of coffee. That's... Uh, that's uh, that's something that goes way back in American history. This has always been a very frightened country, and for pretty understandable reasons. From the very beginning, there were real threats from the people we were suppressing. Uh, the Indians could fight back. Uh, black slaves might revolt uh, after the Haitian Revolution. There's a huge fear, so everybody has to have a gun. We have to protect ourselves. Uh, and it goes on and on. Well, that's a large part of the base of the Republican Party. Uh, another part is the nativist element. If you look at the demography of the United States, uh, the white population is, will soon become a minority. Uh, the phrase that's used is, they are taking our country away from us. Yeah. Uh, they being all of those bad people. And that's a big part, you know, it's, a, it's an element in American society. These sectors have been mobilized by the Republicans roughly in the past 20 years for a very good reason. The Republican Party since about 1995 has stopped being a parliamentary party. It's off the spectrum. They are so dedicated to service to the extreme, to extreme wealth and corporate power that they cannot get votes by putting forth their own programs. So they've turned to other forms of... Uh, 
they've turned to other forms of popular mobilization, uh, what are called you know, social issues. I mean, should you read the Bible in class, uh, anti-abortion, uh, uh, should you know, prevent uh, blacks from voting, or whatever it may be. Uh, that part of the base is strongly pro-Israel. That's one phenomenon, but there's much more than that. Uh, APAC, you know, the lobbying organizations, you know, they're important. Uh, Sheldon Adelson and, uh, uh, you know, the big contributors, yeah, they're important. But I think there's much deeper reasons for uh, the unique Israeli support for, uh, U.S. support for Israeli policies. And you see it if you look over the history. When did this support develop? I mean, it wasn't true in the 1950s. You know, there was support for Israel, but uh, Eisenhower didn't hesitate to force Israel out of the Sinai uh, right before a presidential election, most uh, sensitive moment. Just told them, get out or else. Uh, threatened them, they naturally got out to have to do what the U.S. says. Uh, and, but the big change was in 1967. What happened in 1967? There was a conflict in the Arab world between radical Islam, I mean Saudi Arabia, and secular nationalism, which meant Egypt. The United States pretty consistently supports radical Islam, just as the British did in, their, in the day when they ran the place. Secular nationalism is considered a threat. It might move towards independence. And that is intolerable if you're trying to run the world. Uh, running the world is, uh, I mean, for, you know, for, good, for good reasons, you could go into it, but it is intolerable. And radical Islam has been more under control. Well, in 1967, uh, Israel administered a lethal blow to secular nationalism. They smashed uh, Egypt, which was the center of it, big gift to Saudi Arabia. In fact, there was a war going on at the time between Saudi Arabia and uh, Egypt, a kind of a proxy war in the Yemen, and uh, Israel settled it in favor of Saudi Arabia, the main U.S. ally, the extremist, most extreme Islamic, Amer uh, Islamic radical state, uh, but it's where all the oil is, so that's been the U.S. ally since the uh, you know, 1940s. Uh, and uh, th uh, this was a major gift to the United States and its ally. You take a look, that's when American aid to Israel shot up. In uh, 1970, um, you may recall, there was a, uh, the, the government of Jordan was ca uh, initiated a military campaign against the Palestinians in Jordan, a real massacre. It looked for a while as if Syria might move to protect the Palestinians. The U.S. didn't want that. The U.S. was completely embroiled at that time in Southeast Asia, couldn't do a thing. It asked Israel to mobilize its forces to compel Syria to withdraw. They did, and the U.S. aid to Israel quadrupled that year. And so it continues. There's a very close strategic alliance. Uh, it, it extends to uh, 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 military and intelligence relations, which are very close. So it takes a drone technology. Now, a lot of it's developed in uh, Rafael Industries uh, near Haifa. Uh, Rafa, the main, main Israeli, the Israeli economy by now relies very heavily on uh, uh, high-tech military production and export in close relationship to the United States. Uh, just recent, very recently, a document was released uh, uh, under the Freedom of, uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, uh, demonstrating U.S. participation, tolerance and participation in Israeli nuclear and other high-tech developments uh, since about the 1960s. It's very close if you look at the details. There's an interesting article by William Greider that just came out about it, describing some of the details. Uh, Rafael industry, the major uh, Israeli military industry, is so closely linked to U.S. military industry that it has actually transferred its management headquarters to Washington, 
where the money is. In fact, one of the most interesting exposés from WikiLeaks listed uh, high-level strategic uh, tar uh, locations that the United States ranked as necessary to protect at all costs. One of them was Rafael Military Industries in, um, near Haifa. Uh, intelligence connections have been very close for a long time. These are really significant uh, matters, uh, basic reasons for the continuation of the close relationship. There also are cultural issues, no doubt. Uh, one is uh, Christianity. I mean, Christian Zionism goes back before Jewish Zionism, yeah. and it's very high level. It's not just evangelicals. It's a high level phenomenon. Uh, Lord Balfour, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, you know. Uh, More evidence that what you believe affects your actions. It does. I mean, for them, uh, the Bi these are Bible, re you know, people read the Bible every morning. It's God said that the Jews have to go back to the land, the Palestine, land of Israel. Okay, we've got to do it. Uh, uh, this is a strong element in high-level U.S. policy. Then there's the popular base, like evangelical Christianity, mostly incidentally since about 1950. There's another relation which I can't prove. You can think about it. It seems to me possible. The United States is a settler colonial society. That's a special form of imperialism. Uh, it's true of the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Specific form of imperialism which you don't just rule the colony, like say the British in India, but you, dis you eliminate the population and you settle it. Unique form of imperialism. We're a striking example of it. Well, what's Israel? It's a settler colonial society. I think that, I suspect that that resonates with Americans. Now they're doing what we did, so it's got to be something right about it, because we did it, you know. I can't. Uh... Okay.